A very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to JSLH Commencement Lecture of the School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. On behalf of all faculty, I extend a very warm welcome to the incoming class of 2023. We hope that you're beginning to settle uh, in the campus, and we are looking forward to meeting you in class and outside over the next few weeks. Um, to begin the proceedings uh, for this afternoon, I will invite Professor Kathleen Madrovsky, Dean General School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, to give the welcome address. Kathleen. Okay, um, well, welcome everyone. And I don't know if you're like me, I'm still under the spell of that movie, you know? So uh, I think that I should just be looking at the sky and looking to see what the future will bring. But uh, welcome to the start of a new academic year. I'd just like to see from you a show of hands, who are the first year students? Okay, special welcome to you, and I hope you're settled in, and I hope that you're with, uh, you know, you're, you're able to see other students, but we'll have many arranged mm -hmm. moments for you to come together and to work with each other and get to know everyone and your faculty as well. It all seems a little bit rushed, your arrival, but then as things go on, uh, we have a lot of meetings with student council. They're preparing events. You're going to be going into mentoring, and we've got some very exciting programs and classes. So I was just thinking the other day, though, and I want to give you uh, an idea, because so much is happening as I watch everyone walking around the campus and the new experiences that come forward for everyone. I was thinking, you know, how do you digest everything that's going to be happening to you? How do you make sense out of it? Uh, and you won't at the time, and it'll change and it'll evolve. So I suggest that you write, you know, not a, a blog, a social media blog, but something very personal. Uh, write it to yourselves so that you can look at it later see what your ideas were, and how you've changed, how you've developed. So th this is my bit of advice to you. It came to me when I was going through some of my notes uh, from field work and the personal impressions I had put forward when I was working in Africa and Australia, et cetera. And I thought, you know, I created uh, a different world every time. And it evolved, and my impressions evolved, too. So I'm going to let us go towards what we all are interested in having, the word from our vice chancellor, and also from the wonderful guest speaker. Uh, what, an inspiring, what an inspiring film we've had from Shanak Sen, and I think it's something that's going to stay with us. And this is something that I think is worth writing about yourselves as well and seeing the world through his imagination and the team who worked with him. So thank you all very much. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you very soon. And um, I will, let's give a hand to each other and welcome each other. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. May I now invite uh, the founding vice chancellor, Professor C. R. Rajkumar, to please give the keynote address. Very good afternoon to all of you. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished chief guest and uh, speaker on this occasion, uh, Dr. Sean Exen, uh, an award-winning uh, um, and um, filmmaker and also a multi-talented video artist and writer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sen, for accepting our invitation and uh, being here. Um, so I just want to mention that uh, it's, uh, it's a very special occasion for us uh, here the first week of August to welcome all our students across different schools and programs. 
Uh, my challenge has been that uh, in the year 2009, when we started this university, um, I was uh, also the vice chancellor at that time, and I made a decision to have develop a culture for beginning each academic session uh, for uh, the, uh, the particular school that we started with, with a commencement lecture and signifying the beginning. Now, of course, the Americans have a very different understanding of the word commencement. Commencement constitutes graduation, which we in India call convocation. But uh, for us, the commencement is the beginning. And so we have a commencement lecture, have a distinguished speaker. Now, the problem is it's now we are 15 years old. We have uh, 12 schools. So I have 12 commencement lectures to attend. And in addition to that, we have two institutes, I have uh, then 14 commencement lectures. And we have uh, one postgraduate program which has its own commencement lecture. So essentially, in three days, I'm attending 16 commencement lectures. So I want to seek your apology when I will leave soon after this one. But I want to, I couldn't miss the opportunity to be here. In fact, my office suggested I should do it online, but I said no, I want to say hello to all our students here. So it's such a pleasure to see all of you. Um, I'll spend a few minutes briefly introducing the university, but also the times in which we live. Um, this university was created as a philanthropic initiative of our founding chancellor and benefactor, Mr. Naveen Jindal, in the year 2009. Predate uh, that year, uh, way back in 2008, I was a young student and a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. I dreamt about the idea of building a university in India in the year 1998. I was hugely inspired by my experience of being at Oxford after which I got a few more fellowships to go to Harvard. Before that, I studied in two Indian universities, Loyola College Madras and University of Delhi. And that experience of being at both Oxford and Harvard and my experience of uh, studying in these institutions um, uh, essentially helped me to think about the idea of institution building. I was fascinated by the idea of not-for-profit private universities, largely in the US. And I looked at those institutions very closely. And then I practiced law in New York and then taught law in Japan and Hong Kong. All those years, I wrote a paper entitled Establishing India's First Global University. Got to meet with this Indian benefactor by name, Mr. Jindal, in the year 2006. Spent one year persuading him to do three things. One, to make a substantial financial commitment. Second, to do it in a not-for-profit manner. And third, to let me have the academic freedom and autonomy and independence to build a world-class university in India. By late 2007, he agreed to all of it and invited me to move to India. Early 2008, I moved to India, and from 2008 onwards, we began the process of institution building, from land acquisition to formulation of curriculum, course structure, program development, faculty recruitment plan, student admissions process, hiring of architects, construction engineers, contractors, and persuading the government of Haryana to pass a new law to establish the first private university in the state of Haryana. All of that happened in a relatively short span of time. As late as 27th January 2009, the government passed the new law establishing OP Jindal Global University as the first private university in the state of Haryana. And we began the process of recruitment of faculty, admission of students, and construction of campus. One aspect that was so important at the very beginning is that at a time when India was building more and more colleges of engineering and science and technology and even medicine, our vision when we began the journey was to build a liberal arts university. Our focus from the very beginning has been to be at the vanguard of promoting humanity, social sciences and professional education in law and later in architecture. So I want to say that the establishment of the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities as we progress in the journey from the law school, the business school, the School of International Affairs, the School of Public Policy was a very natural uh, evolution. We believe in the vision and idea of liberal education and that is so deeply embedded in the culture of this institution. Um, I want to quickly say that these 15 years have been uh, absolutely fantastic. But there are five things that shaped our vision and continue to shape our mission. And I would like all our students to be part of that vision as well. First, we are a global university. For us to be a global university means to have a global curriculum, to have a global course structure, a global program, a global faculty, a global research agenda, all of which promoting global interaction. It means for us to be able to recruit faculty members from around the world. So I'm happy to report that the 1,200 full-time faculty members that we have in this university come from 52 countries in the world. These, the students 
who started off with only 100 in 2009 and now nearly 11,000. They come from 60 countries in the world and of course both the students and faculty come from all states and union territories of India. It also means as a global university for us to build international collaborations with universities and um, I'm happy to report that we have partnerships with over 400 universities in 75 different countries in the world and many students of the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities including from the BA Liberal Arts and Humanities and the BFA program they are and of course the BA in Sociology program they are potentially uh, great beneficiaries of these relationships including student exchange programs, dual degree programs, short term study abroad programs and immersion programs. The second part of our vision is our strong commitment to research. We are very, very fortunate that we have an outstanding group of faculty members, including several of them in the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. They are not only engaged in teaching, but also at the uh, forefront in research and knowledge creation and publications. Uh, but the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities is quite unique as it has taken the research agenda to the students itself. It is the first school which essentially promoted the idea of undergraduate research colloquium and consistently for many years now under the visionary leadership of Dean Modrowski and other colleagues including Jenny and others, they have been at the forefront of giving for giving opportunities to pursue research for undergraduate students. This research is of course has enabled because of the one to nine faculty student ratio we have in our university. We have 55 research centers and three capacity building institutes and that has been part of our vision from the very beginning. The fourth aspect of our university is our strong commitment to interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity is deeply woven into all what we do and so I am again uh, you know, I'm happy to share with you that every day after 4 p.m. we offer 400 courses in this university which are available for all schools and all programs including the liberal arts students to be able to take courses across all schools. And the last uh, important part of what we do is that we are a diversified institution. We believe in values of pluralism and inclusivity. 50% uh, of our students are women, 55% of our full-time faculty members are women, nearly 47% of leadership positions are held by women and we of course also forge other forms of diversity that are deeply embedded in our institution. Um, I want to end by saying that uh, the last 15 years have been a great learning experience. Uh, each initiative and each school, each program, each milestone that we have reached including one of our recent milestones in the last three years where we have now been consistently ranked as India's first ranked private university with the QS World Rankings and to have been given the status of an institution of eminence by the government of India. Only eight public and four private universities among the 1,100 universities have been given the status. All these milestones have been possible because of the extraordinary contribution of our faculty members, the deep commitment and dedication of all of them, but also our uh, wonderful students who have come from many parts of India and around the world. For the students who have joined the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities, you have an amazing opportunity to pursue liberal education. Uh, you also have an opportunity to take courses across the schools and programs, but also you are part of a campus ecosystem where there will be people who are not like you, who are going to be different from you. They may have different uh, social and political and economic uh, and religious backgrounds. They may come from different linguistic backgrounds. They may have a very different worldview. But the opportunity to meet and engage and interact with new people from different parts of India and the world is what this campus offers to you. And I also hope that you will, beyond your academics, engage in other activities, including sports and extracurricular activities, music, theater, dance, drama, and many other things which the university offers. We have over 25 student-run societies, uh, all of which are there for you to participate. We have extensive sports facilities. And as you will see from the campus environment, all these are there for you, for you to make the best use of it. Now, for, the, for those of you who have joined the university just now, I'm sure you have left the school and come into a college university system. And now, of course, you must have been part of a fairly regimented, uh, fairly, uh, you know, organized uh, and fairly restricted, uh, you know, ecosystem in high schools. And now, suddenly, you are going to be having uh, extraordinary freedom for you to function and operate. For once, you don't have to wear uniforms, and I don't see anybody wearing a uniform. We don't have a uniform in this university, and I, I must confess that there are some colleges and universities which do have a uniform, but we don't have one. 
But uh, more importantly, uh, you are in a position to exercise that freedom. Now, with all freedom comes responsibility and your ability to make that change through being responsible is also part of the learning uh, experience that you will have. Lastly, I want to say that uh, this is a special moment because we have experienced uh, two years of pandemic with no opportunity to meet and interact with each other. Of course, we at uh, Jindal Global University, we had an entirely two years of online education. Our students were online. Uh, but I must say that that's a huge privilege, both institutionally and the students that we have had. Um, UNESCO has estimated that 1.5 billion young people across the world were simply removed out of education because there was no online education. And they also have said that these people will not be able to come back into education. It is also true that while India and many institutions like us had online education, the reality is that we need three things effectively to work for online education to be meaningful a reasonably and working electric, electricity available at homes, a reasonable and working Wi-Fi connection, and of course, a reasonably working equipment, all three of which are needed to pursue online education. I'm sad to report that 84% of Indian households do not have these three things. That means that 84% of Indian households were simply deprived of an opportunity to be educated during the pandemic. So I say this because you are privileged. And with all privilege comes responsibility. And so the opportunity to make a difference and to use your education to be a, a, a force to change the world and make the world for better, all of that ought to be part of the learning experience at the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities. I must say that the faculty members of the Jindal School of Liberal Arts and Humanities are extremely committed to engaging with you. Uh, they are very hands-on school. They are very closely uh, working with the for students, so you are in safe hands. So I would like to take this opportunity to wish you the very best. As I said, I will be leaving shortly and I will deprive myself of the opportunity to hear Dr. Sen, but I hope to meet up with him on another occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar. Um, it is a pleasure for me to introduce the speaker for this year's commencement lecture. He is the man that many of us rooted for at the Academy Award announcements in March this year. He is also the man whose cinematic and intellectual genius shines through the deeply moving and important film that we all just saw. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Dr. Shonak Sen. <laughs> Shonak is an Academy Award nominated filmmaker, writer, um, and scholar based in Delhi. His film, All That Breeds, received nominations at the 2023 Academy and BAFTA Awards. The film won awards at Cannes, Sundance, BFI London, IDA and Cinema Eye, and 24 other film festivals. Cities of Sleep, his earlier film made in the year 2016, was also his first feature-length documentary, was shown at various major international film festivals and won six international awards. Shonak has received grants from Sundance, Tribeca, IDFA Amsterdam, amongst others. He's received the Pro Helvetia Residency in Switzerland, the Sarai CSDS grant, and the Charles Wallace grant as visiting scholar at Cambridge University. Shauna holds a PhD in cinema from the School of Arts and Aesthetics, JNU, and is published in journals including Bioscope and Widescreen. May I now request the Registrar of the University, Dr. Uh, Professor Sridhar Patnayak and Professor Kathleen Madrowski to felicitate Shonak uh, on our behalf and offer to him the memento and university scarf as, as a token of our gratitude to him. Finally, what we've all been waiting for, 
I invite Dr. Sean Aksane to deliver the JSLH commencement lecture 2023 titled On Beginnings. Shonak, the stage is yours. Thank you. I don't think I've been called a doctor as many times in my life. Um, thank you so much for the organizing team uh, for the invitation um, and to the vice chancellor who isn't here. 16, con uh, 16 commencement speeches sound like a lot. Um, and congratulations to the incoming students at Jindal. Uh, before I start, I should say that I was just warned by some friends or faculty here who just read what I was going to read out and said the second half is significantly better. So calibrate your expectations accordingly. Uh, while organizing my thoughts to write this, it struck me that in recent years, I've mostly been called upon to speak at the end of things. Most commonly, it's speaking after a film in the Q&A or post the film's release for interviews. In short, I can't recall speaking in the beginning of anything. This, insofar as a commencement means to begin or start something, made me think of beginnings in general. That is what I will dwell on today. I've always had a special love for beginnings, for the first page of a novel or the first scene of a film. The first page where you have no clue where the story will lead, the world and its form are not yet tamed or contained or framed, where the opening utterance is yet to be absorbed into the body of the story. This is where you can just begin with four minutes of rats in the dark, as you just saw, and generally the audience will forgive you. But beginnings are a moment of opening out, where things are still buoyant and unfixed. It's a small transient moment wherein the fog of not knowing is more freeing than the suffocating clarity of knowing. It's not just the beginning of books or movies that I love, but also the beginning of making something. The beginning of an idea, for example, when a random thought appears as a glow at the back of one's head, or a texture, a feeling, or a mood. When it's just dropped out of nowhere and new neurons in your brain suddenly start firing. So even with All That Breeds, for instance, I'm assuming some of you, how many of you were at the screening right now for All That Breeds? Okay, so uh, that film actually began with, um, um, I was stuck in a traffic jam at the BRT, as one often is, and every time you look up, you know, especially in the winters, you see this kind of a gray monochromatic sky with these lazy black dots sort of gliding, and uh, which are the black kites, and it began initially with just a kind of texture or a feeling of, you know, something that all of us feel in the city in the winters of, you know, the air conditioners of spaceship Earth going a bit awry. So it started with this kind of a vague um, triangulation of air, birds, and humans. The first spark of an idea is really a sacred space because it distills a felt, fleshy, immediate experience. The most original writing usually pours out in the so-called vomit draft, that initial spark when writing feels like auto-hypnosis. All we know is that something has begun. We are at a commencement lecture. No one knows what will happen in your life, what shapes it will take. But at this fleeting moment, it is marked by a productive mystery of not knowing. I'm obviously no one to lecture you on life conduct, but what I'll do here is enlist some personal strategies and regrets, all via the lens of beginnings. By the way, as an aside, uh, like an idiot, initially I confirmed this talk without actually cognizing that this was not the usual screening Q&A. And the cold horror of realization dawned on me a few days ago. Suffice to say, I've never been more grateful about the distance between Sonipat Narela and CR Park, which I found was the perfect time to edit down a speech like this. I say this, of course, half lightly, but in truth, the commencement speech is deceptively hard. One has to guard against its tendencies towards triteness, its smug reformatory zeal, or the general finger-wagging sermonizing on how to optimize life. In college, every time I heard one, I'd be left anxious or nauseous. And oddly bereft that I was either wasting potential now or will waste it in the future. There was no... It was as if there was some prescriptively wholesome way of comporting life that I was botching up. Almost compensatorily, I was tempted to title this speech, It's All Downhill From Here. And say mainly that the entropic arrow of time inevitably takes us towards cholesterol and diabetes and impenetrable income tax fines and property battles 
and the and the sad breakdown of beloved friendships personal losses and the realization that so much of adult life is seamlessly interwoven days of semi drudgery and really the one helpful thing a commencement speech could address is the arts of coping thankfully the speech since took a less morose turn and my main focus today is to look at beginnings as a conceptual emotional and creative position my first piece of advice is to cultivate an inner life in other words be meta which means two things firstly cultivate the ability to witness the world with an alert observer soft edge distance a kind of arm's length consciousness secondly be aware of the sovereign entity that is your mind experiencing the world from the slightly critical and poetic remove building up a relationship with your mind where it is a where it is a private cranial kingdom of your own that you wander in and discover things that surprise you that you irrigate and nourish can be truly rewarding it's also a muscle that a liberal arts education can help develop my favorite english literature professor in du where i did my undergrad would keep exhorting us to be patient with interesting half thoughts that float about and niggle for more attention in our brains i'm certain that my best personal practice is to write down interesting thoughts as one has them i what i tend to do is whenever i have a semi okay thought i usually send a whatsapp to a friend who's changed their number and sort of keep storing it in it and these are like you know this could be any image or thought or feeling or mood that you feel uh while coming to uh, sonipat narela i uh, i saw some images that i wrote down and so for instance right at the opposite the gate of the university there was somebody cutting a tree and as the tree fell um the pollen in the tree which is very thick sort of held the outline so for 2 seconds after the tree fell there was like a spectral after image for 2 seconds and then it sort of dissipated you know and these are always things that there is no way i would have remembered it till next week had i not written it down so my advice really is to catch thoughts and catch ideas because they're really incredibly fleeting and um, transient i was just discussing with a friend uh, recently who quoted the following think of your mind like a pond full of fish and each fish is a feeling try to be the pond not the fish Of course this is in some senses meditation 101 practices of mindfulness encourage us to witness our own thoughts coming and going to not conflate yourself with the thought to understand that the emotion of sadness or anger that you currently feel is temporary and will soon enough morph into something else to conflate yourself with your thoughts or to mistake the fish for the pond is how one gets miserably drowned in oneself my favorite days or when my mind is alert not snowed under undeconstructed thought or the loud din of the world when my brain is able to mobilize around me as raw fodder and twist it into ideas in this mode you start loving traffic jams long queues at bureaucratic offices and in general your own company you start running playful algorithms in your head of agar ye hota to kya hota what is it what would happen if this happens and various such exercises and fancy on these days thoughts are their own rewards it's truly tough though to be patiently open and playful liberal arts courses at their best nudge towards this quality of the examined life alongside an examined mind slowly over time with an accumulation of good days you manage to sit with the discomfort and be patient with the unsafe mess that is a new idea Over time you realize that there is no need to worry about connecting with the universal or worry about whether many people would like it you write for an audience of one yourself what you feel moved by is all you make work about having an inner life of mind also means loving the process of iterations in other words all writing is rewriting and all those clichés you realize that the first draft is just shoveling of sand into a box It's in the later drafts that you actually bit by bit chisel the sand castles with through tiny imperfect incisions by constantly reviewing the work from different perspectives. You learn that the fifth draft is exponentially better than the second. When uh, just to give you more examples from all that breeds when the film started all I knew was that I wanted to make something vaguely on skies and birds in Delhi. 
and over time it obviously became about the intense relationship between the brothers it became about the political and slowly the ecological the ecological took on a different kind of a valence or a meaning and the real uh, secret behind this is really having faith in the world of drafts because the more you iterate the world the work becomes full of a kind of plenitude that feels almost alien to yourself and you know over time you realize that even the process of iterations and editing is essentially about having an inner life of mind it is to be aware of the mind's radical mutability to know that you are simply not the same person who made draft 1 the reason you read the first draft and ask which total idiot wrote this trash is because it was indeed a different mind a different person each draft is delicious proof that we are not locked into oneself of neuroplasticity and of changeability the act of iterations remind us that we are actually allowed to keep starting things over in life to keep chick- chipping away the world is not homeostatic thankfully beginnings can be insufferably boring as well the truth is that work when it's being made is really unglamorous gritty and painful in my case the glamorous shiny stuff of red carpets glitzy film festivals can or the oscars or getting selfies with hollywood stars and directors is a very minor part of the professional work these are often superficial indices and every field has its own hollow markups of success whether you're a lawyer or a psychiatrist or a filmmaker or a journalist the real work always looks incredibly mundane and unsexy it entails showing up on the desk every day and trying to spoon out your insights in search of a genuinely good page or if it's a documentary showing up every day and waiting for the world to reward you with accidents it resembles slow foraging or or painful waiting rooms as you wrestle with your emotional physical and financial demons all that breeds took 3 very long hard years to make and it really takes about 400 years 400 hours of footage for one happy accident of a naughty kite flying away with the character's glasses yet despite said torments the blue collared boring beginning parts are as pleasurable as the public successes at the end the public validation of the work is great but truly the process is the real reward i know this sounds like a cliche but the truth is when you've jumped off a cliff or on a hunch alone or are in a state of free fall and you see the world through the fever dream lens of an idea it's here as the idea swirls through some delirious birth canal that is most fun when you and your colleagues the crew members of the film in my case sit a year later and be nostalgic about the film it's never ever yaad hai jab hame wo prize mila tha aur yaad hai jab steven spielberg se mile the it's never that it's always yaad hai jab hum wo shoot karne ka try kar rahe the aur yaad so it's always about the it's always about the drama of discovery and never the drama of public success successes are great mind you but more like the validation confetti your ego desperately seeks don't get me wrong given a chance i love more selfies with lustrous hollywood stars but i'm certain that the top joy is in the making the story goes that russo was asked what he would do if he knew the world was ending tomorrow he replied that he would plant a tree when werner herzog the filmmaker was asked the same question he replied he would make a film what this nudges towards is the joy of being in the process of making something how it transforms our sense of today and tomorrow which brings me to an inevitable problem pra- practicality pragmatism and worst of all money the most comically bad and grotesque decisions i decision i made in my educational life was taking low behold commerce with maths in class 11 and 12 the ominous cloud of words like placement package jobs realistic etc were showered on me and this dark cloud often rears its head in life but somehow every time i've taken up gigs or projects because the money might be good it's not just been a bad experience but also it has never yielded much money either instead whenever i've chased an idea genuinely it was not only a great experience but also more financially rewarding somehow 
It's not easy at all, of course, but originality and rigor are deceptively pragmatic and practical strategies. Of course, sometimes many of us might have material hardships and need to do, need to take expedient decisions. But do that if you really, really have to. I find that practicality often becomes a fig leaf for the invisible demons of procrastination, insecurity, and self-doubt. Taking up jobs that already feel lifeless and inert will become too psychologically costly down the line. To be open to the world is also a deeply ideological choice. Human beings neurologically are designed to be scared of what we don't immediately understand or know. Our mammalian brains are obviously nervous of new things, things that we haven't been exposed to before. It's the epochal dance of between the curiosity of the new and the fear of the new, between productive new adventures and dangerously harmful encounters. For me, an idiot is somebody who's not able to bypass the mammalian response and responds to the other with narrow meanness. The world is tremendously plural and varied, and it is a real poverty of imagination and empathy to reject that which doesn't re- resemble your own grammar of life. Hatred is often the lowest hanging fruit and usually betrays a mind that is increasingly calcified and stultified. Sadly, it's, I'm not certain if a liberal arts education inoculates you against myopic certitudes, but if anything, it hopefully alerts you to the value of difference and otherness. Being open helps you with the most tough thing in life, which is coping. I say this based on some of my own recent regrets. I won't assume that students here haven't faced personal losses, but on an average, serious losses or health adversities visit upon us a bit later in life. I had the biggest loss of my life in the last two years. I lost a parent, someone I, an only child, was unusually close to. I was absurdly impre- unprepared for it and for the most part collapsed and folded up in a heap. In hindsight, I've led a charmed, non-tragic and laughably complacent life before the sudden passing away of my father. I simply did not have the emotional endurance needed to weather the pain. If I had the proverbial time machine, the one thing I would develop is the muscle of maturity, to remember the transience of one's good time with beloved family members and comport oneself with the necessary grace of expiry dates. To have an alert mind that doesn't assume the ground you stand on is perpetually stable. The monumental grief and the mountain of logistical responsibilities that befell me reconfigured me for the worse. Worse in the sense that I started falling seriously sick over time. I was diagnosed with an autoimmune sickness and the last two years have been bedeviled by annoying health-related suffering. My foundational relation with my body changed and if I could go back in time, I would change the cavalier carefree relation I had with my own health till age 30. I would, I deeply regret it now. I am surprisingly sick and honestly suffering on some days. It has cast a long shadow over my work life and has changed my relationship with food. This is all to say that all cliched platitudes our parents direct, direct at us from sleeping early, eating okay, exercising, etc. is annoyingly enough good advice. When grief and health-related crises rack one's life, you fall back rather fast on some fundamentals. One such life raft is friendships. Friendships which see you for who you are, replete with vulnerabilities and uglinesses, are more valuable than one can imagine. Success gives us the bizarre illusion of an armor, as if we don't need friends. Nothing could be more wrong. No good news is actually fun until you report it to a loving champion of your life. I was... uh, Actually, at uh, uh, Sundance, when the Oscar nomination news came in, and I felt this point very intensely then. Um, I was alone in an Airbnb, and the news came in at about, say, 5 in the morning. And of course, it's absolutely bizarre, because you have a theoretical sense of what that kind of a news will do to upturn your life. But um, unless and until you get through to somebody who really can cheer for you or share in the happiness that usually it feels incredibly hollow. The true mark of a life plunging into trouble is a diminishing circle of long-time friends. Towards the very end, as his memory and cognitive tools started depleting, my happiest memory of my father is him pacing about our balcony, giggling like a schoolboy as he talked to old friends. Salman Rushdie once said on the matter, whenever someone knows, someone who knows you, disappears, you lose one version of yourself. 
yourself as you were seen as you were judged to be lover or enemy mother or friend those who know us construct us and their several knowings slant the different facets of our character like diamond cutters tools each such loss is a step leading to the grave where all versions blend and end you don't need many friends just a small handful that stick it's not easy and webs of misunderstandings my own hubris and an egotistical overreliance of my on my professional identity are the things i have to battle to hold on to old friendships friends witness us and that alone has a medicinal virtue that is well worth fighting the icky emotional fights for in a way the film made sense for all of us also because of the kind of bonhomi and camaraderie that me and the whole crew shared the point is that the uh, it's the process that actually makes sense not the telos not the awards and in a sense what makes sense is to hold on to a sense of beginning to be open and to be alert to ideas that surround you and to pay attention to when you're bored um thanks um thank you so much shonak um for such uh, such an open such a reflective um talk uh saying the things that all of us like you said have heard time and again but saying them so poignantly um and also really uh you know saying it from the vectors of your own experience uh thank you very much um i now invite uh, questions both and reflections on the film as well as on the talk that shonak just delivered uh there will be microphones when with, with uh, student volunteers on both ends so um just if in just a few minutes if you want to take uh, uh take a beat and then and then we can begin the questions uh it was the film was uh, very fascinating is very moving as uh, everyone would agree the obvious questions i think many people share this question uh the first question have two questions the first one is that the uh, the people who are the main characters of the film who are saving the birds uh what were they trained or they just uh, you know out of practice that uh, you know they they gathered it it's a pretty obvious question the second one perhaps is a bit a bit more difficult um you n nicely captured the background context of what was what else was going on uh in 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 the city in the country in the the backdrop uh, of the of their lives the riots and the ca and rc agitation uh, to us in india it's pretty obvious we know what was going on but uh, since this uh, film has been uh, screened internationally for a wide international audience uh i'm wondering how much they could make out of uh i mean they one can if you don't know the background you can see the riots happening but the deeper context of it how how much of that comes out gets conveyed to a audience who is not familiar with what's going on to india okay i'll answer the thanks for that question i'll answer the second question first when the film began it was primarily meant to be a ecological film or a philosophically minded film that's what i was interested in but the thing is that uh, you know the city was on the boil then and because the city was just going through such a tumultuous and turbulent time um it was really like we had to arm wrestle with the question of how much we let that sort of leak in now the thing is that the characters that the brothers themselves are not um, conventionally political in that they're not interested so much in the socio political they would say that even the relationship between humans and birds is political which i think all of us would also think it is but not so much in sectarian or identity uh, politics over time what happened is that you know like we realized that the out that the outside world would slowly kind of drip in or hemorrhage in in small nuanced ways and um you know so a character goes to a balcony and you hear the distant uh, sound of people of crowds protesting or some such or there's a tv so 
in a way the uh, outside world sort of leaks in it kind of hemorrhages in through the acoustic and it's a kind of it's like the epistemic wallpaper of their lives so it's not sort of dealt with in a frontal sort of a way but you feel a kind of texture that something is ongoing now the thing is that when you're making an, uh, a doc you don't want to crowbar your own ideas in you want to respect the integrity of what you're shooting at the same time you don't want to invisibilize what's happening outside so you have to respect the way in which it manifested in the characters lives so th therefore it's sort of oblique and tangential and subtle but hopefully the texture of it becomes clear in terms of its reception outside the country i don't think it's important for people to really know the intricate details of exactly what that's actually not germane to either the film or the universe that it is constructing what you need to understand is that the brothers do what they do through a like you know they're like three don quixotes who are trafficking in micro miracles in terms of every kite that they save uh, daily that they go do what they do despite what's happening and a you know there is a smell of trouble in the film and of course it's oblique and not frontal but that's all one needs to communicate i also have to say that you know when a work of art is overly pamphleteering or reveals its cards too easily i you know it can fall either way because you end up either preaching to the choir or alienating people and the point of any cultural object is to be a trojan horse right and the idea is to open up a conversation you know to emotionally move people even when they're unsuspecting and that's the kind of thing that we have to that's the skill or craft uh, that has to be mobilized to have a conversation and make people move like uh, feel something and not be actually pedantic in some kind of sloganeering uh, way uh, so the first question no they're completely self taught it is entirely and profoundly autodidactic hello yeah so i'm a second year student and i would like to question on the fact that why did you think the background score to be in a way that it is because i was actually very intrigued when you actually used noise and uh, the background score or the music in a very defining manner rather than making it into a very uh, sub subtle background score but you made it very prominent that you wanted the audience to understand through it uh did you feel like it was subtle or did you feel like it was not subtle it's not subtle oh well it was intended to be subtle but uh, <laughs> the thing is that um so when we began so i'll tell you the kind of uh, music that i really usually detest okay that i abhor in films where basically the music underlines what the you know if a, if if something is meant to be sad you have Uh, tragic clarinets right now i uh, i usually hate that kind of uh, you know nudging or finger pointing mm. um so the idea was that we were working with electronic distortions mm. and a lot of it is we took samples from say the ruffling of feathers or you know claws of kites etc and sort I of stretched that out yes it was meant to be subtle and um, i i mean but i this is not me actually disagreeing with you because Uh, if there was one thing that i would alter about the film uh, it would be actually dialing down some of the like i would keep it more vacant actually yes but i mean uh, you know there are bits where i think especially at the end where uh, i think i could have been less nervous about um underlining things but no that wasn't my intention was to not actually um dial it up at all oh but i actually uh realize that when you were make uh, making that uh, distortions that you said electronic distortions that was very much prominent to me because the way the music was it was not exactly focusing on a feeling rather it was trying to give a background understanding of what was going on so therefore i was much more intrigued by the idea of making a music platform which makes a background understanding rather than 
exponentially explaining the feeling of what the scene means and what the scene means to the characters um well firstly i am tempted to deflect the blame onto the speakers in the classroom <laughs> uh, but uh, sec so I, i it's not clear to me that those are mutually exclusive binaries um firstly when you're uh, making when you're putting non diegetic music yes. um i don't really it's not really about what the characters are feeling alone because you're working music is always about the relationship between the part and the whole yes. of the film right the broader kind of parabola of the film and um the ambition was to try and like uh, you know create a kind of third meaning in connection to it so but i don't know if you can demarcate neatly ever between what the characters are feeling and uh, what the experience of the film is look i mean i can't if you didn't like it then i can't defend it <laughs> but uh, i liked <laughs> it i liked it <laughs> yeah but thank you for that question thank you so much uh hi i am also a second year student my question basically revolves around the a lot of blur scenes that were there the a lot of scenes where the camera work there was a little bit of blur so in order for the focus shift and uh, the camera focused on the movement of insects and as you right mentioned in your speech as an address as well that the movie started with a scene of dogs and rats in the darkness so i just wanted to uh, connect something here that were the scenes of life of insects and other animals or basically familiar scenes that we witness but we don't care much about connected to the monologue that the characters or the brothers gave about their mother saying to respect all forms of life that breathe yes. and how we are unfamiliar about it and y- yeah i mean in in so far as um look uh, the f- i was when we began we were more sure of what we did not want to make we did not want to make a kind of a uh, you know a ngoish kind of a film about uh you know there's certain kinds of environmental discourses that often become very pedantic and uh you know like a kind of bleeding heart sentimentality secondly we d- we did not want to make a very uh overtly frontally political film because that was just not where the film's uh, organic life was heading but most importantly i did not want to make a sweet film about nice people doing good things and there's a real danger of that with this film right so the idea was to try and uh, make it more um, conceptually or um, more meditative in a way and the beauty of the brothers is when you zoom out and it's not just about their relationship with the birds right there is a kind of a joy in the way they deal with life writ large on the canvas of the city and the panoply of animals that you see in the film from the rats to the pigs to the snails to the etc is about that kind of a simultaneity of the city or the urban being opened up as this space where the human and the non-human sort of jostle cheek by jowl right and the main thing is like you correctly pointed out that you s- mentioned the blur but obviously the common integer in terms of film grammar in all of them is that they're all single take shots right beat the rats the all this every time you see these other animals is it's a single take and the idea was to show a kind of simultaneity between the sit- between the sort of human inhabitation in the city and the animal and if you watch like um, you know a, s- a turtle for 3 minutes something happens in terms of the deceleration and quality of attention right and it essentially makes you think of like you correctly said what they think of their uh, what they describe as the mother's philosophy of not hierarchizing between all that breeds and that's why that's a kind of titular ri- line but basically the idea was that it had to transcend right it had to like go outside of this um this really small decrepit basement and transcend and zoom out and become about something it had to be about the entanglement of human non human lives and a kind of neighborliness or kinship between different forms of life and for that to happen you have to you know make people look at things and if it if that is the case get people a bit bored by watching right of course if you start a film with 4 minutes of rats that's when you start sort of setting the spectatorial contract right like sit and watch and soon a kind of uh, you know like there's a pleasure in watching itself so you will get rewarded by watching so i mean all of these things together 
uh, I had a second question. Uh, basically, in the movie as well, you got the brothers to talk about a lot of gritty and emotional aspects of things. Like uh, uh, the one of the brothers talked about their own death and how they imagined it. Like they could have a heart attack and die in the basement and talk about their mother and how would she would have felt about all the things that they did. Yeah. So what was the process of relationship building with the brothers and to get them to address their own relationships and everything in such emotional intensity? Well, it's really a function of time. I shot with them for three years and by this film I, ha I was, I had wisened up a bit to how to do it, which I wasn't in my first film fully. Um, so the thing is, it's really, you know, now I know that in the first month, the material that you get is trash, it's garbage, because people are too conscious of, and you know, all conversations go like, hello, bhai, how are you? Today? You know, it's like, it feels like a stilted uh, thing. But why it's very important is because it's a necessary rites of passage. And the main tool in your toolkit is actually boredom. It's when you, the characters are really bored of you and the presence of the camera is when you know you and your crew is not an obstru obtrusive uh, presence. And um, that's when you get the material that is actually soaked in a kind of banality or everydayness or mundaneness, which is what you actually want, right? It's almost like the joke in our crew is that you have to wait for the first yawn. And that's when you know that some walls are beginning to erode. And it's really, it's like life, right? Like friendships often accrete over time. And the bit that you mentioned where he talks about his own death and the, uh, whether his life has any meaning at all or not is something that we shot at the end of three years. So it takes time to kind of like slowly open up. I mean, one, th one more thing to add to this is that um, your own life becomes kind of raw material or fodder for the work that you're shooting. Like you start seeing the world through the demon eyes of the film and the film gets very affected by your life. So the I had a big person loss in my own life. And what that did was that it actually made the film more somber because in a lot of interviews they would respond um, with thoughts about their own bereavement or grief. And a new kind of a social contract then gets forged. So I mean all those things together kind of prize open uh, something. That was it. Thank you so much. Uh, hi. So, um, hello. <laughs> so, uh, I watched the film for the first time a, a couple of months ago, and this is a question that stayed with me since. If you look at this incredible poster, which is the point of connection between bird and human, um, and then you watch the film, you sp the first time you encounter the black kite, you're looking it in the eye. And you continue that frame pretty much right through the film. You're trying to draw out that connection between the audience and the bird. but. In an interesting contrast, very rarely do you make eye contact with the humans, even when they're speaking sort of piece to camera style into the camera. They're not looking straight into the camera. They're not connecting with the camera the same way. And I just wanted to ask, why? Because uh, when characters look into the camera, it's atrocious. Because, you know, I mean, we've seen tons of films with talking head interviews. And they're just, you know, there's not a moment of effervescent truth in it, you know. So after you've spent so much time and such, uh, you know, so many long journeys going all the way to Wazirabad to shoot and so on. So you don't want to again make them conscious by making them look at the camera. But anyway, that's a, that's actually a surfacial, facetious answer. The truth is that... Um, I was interested in showing the kites as a kind of otherworldly um, magical um, beings because when the birds first fell in love with the, when the brothers first fell in love with the birds, you know, they describe it with a kind of aura of this alien snake with glass eyes. You know, it's that kind of a, as if it's from another planet. And you're interested in invoking some of that wondrous magical enchanting quality and therefore and you know kites are really handsome raptors so you're trying to figure out a relationship with them where you're doing portraits of them um, while not showing them as pitiable injured birds right so there was a very conscious kind of 
uh, way in which we designed your uh, i tried to design the kind of visual relationship with the guides with the brothers there was no way i was going to put a camera in front of them like this one and make them i mean i hadn't noticed this camera and this minute i've noticed this camera i've started sitting differently so that this is precisely the sort of thing that you want to avoid right the whole idea is i mean you i hate the term um, fly on the wall because you're never actually a fly on the wall you know it's really funny so the term fly on the wall came from frederick wiseman one of the uh, older documentary directors uh, well he later sort of uh, disavowed it S which is complete kind of like if i was sh if he was shooting this room the camera would the ambition of the camera would be to be invisible so that everybody's behavior is kind of unvarnished the other position in this spectrum is say werner herzog's who says don't be a fly on the wall be a hornet that stings right so his is a kind of a kurethne wala interview sort of a style right where he's extremely um, pressing and like is able to actually uh, invoke things by by how much he uh, interrogates but i prefer like you know something in the middle like like a worm that's slithering just extending the insect metaphor that where the camera is present and the audience and the characters are conscious of it but over time there's a kind of looseness that occurs you know where there's a kind of sweet spot between being conscious and there being a kind of um the difference between um characters being and behaving in the frame and that's the kind of middle point that you're usually searching for i Can think I? Uh, we have time for one question could we let the student have the question if maybe we can club one or two and then i can answer okay, one go okay we can we can then have to are are there any other questions on this side yeah yes go ahead yeah uh, thank you shonok uh, for that lovely film as well as the speech i missed it in my school's uh, arts and aesthetics so i'm from there <laughs> but uh, thank you so much i could uh, do it today uh, the question is about drafting and i teach writing so i'm interested about that so these scenes where there's a turtle or there's a tortoise coming out of that garbage bin or um, that snail walking against the fire that scene or even the centipede uh against the backdrop of an aeroplane zooming off in that puddle of water so where in 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 the span of 3 years when do you because obviously you can't plan this when you're writing the first draft right so when do they pour in and when do you decide that they become part of your frame because that becomes very important to the larger uh trajectory of the film as well as, as the canvas so where do these details come in because they are fabulous thank you thank you fabulous. i understand that. should we club one or two other questions with this? uh let's i think uh, yes um, good afternoon sir firstly i'd like to congratulate you on the film it was extremely intriguing my question to you is how do you get past the fears and apprehensions that come along with making a relatively offbeat film and the anticipation of the reception it will receive I think there's one more question at the back and uh, we'll stop there. Uh hello sir. I was really moved by the movie and especially how the scenes of certain animals were framed as sort of a reflection of the ongoing background. Especially and even the foreground characters, the brothers, their relationship and their relationship with the birds, it almost functioned as if it was an under the background was actually the underlying concept so what are your thoughts on that it's a very good question thank you are we taking more or should i are there any other questions okay sure one and another one and then we'll stop um hi very inspiring documentary first of all uh my question to you is uh you have spent a lot of time being in delhi um was this the reason that you were inspired to make this movie or if you hadn't spent as much time uh in delhi would you still have made uh this uh, as a subject of your documentary right Uh hi I really loved the film and I just wanted to ask um 
um, how the brothers are doing now, you know, post sure, COVID sure, and yeah. you know, um, what's the success of your film? I just wanted to know that if you know how how that has changed their lives and sure, their work. Sure. Okay, should I? Because now it's quite a few. Um, Drafting, right, right. So, um, well, firstly, in docs, you never ever, except when you're trying to raise money and writing log lines and synopses, but you never ever commit to paper what's going to happen because, you know, the documentary enterprise is a kind of a r radical embrace of the fundamental unscriptedness of the world. You know, life is implotting action, and the main thing that you do is you turn up and you hope and pray for accidents. That's what it is, right? And over time, it's a kind of very slow accrual of things and sort of shapes emerge. But the question of drafting or iterations is very, very interesting actually in docs because you are writing in a way, but not writing at all in a kind of pre, uh, like, you know, uh, pre facto way. The edit is when you're doing a lot of the writing. And actually, alongside that, when you're just dumping the footage every day, you look at it and you realize, well, maybe we want to do this. And it sort of slowly starts turning, like shape shifting as you're making it. So there's a kind of active um, autopoiesis, a kind of active writing of it. But the main thing is really the edit. The edit is where all the battles are won and lost in uh, doc. Because remember, we had about 400 hours of footage. And this is, we actually had another character in the film. This is a guy who um, is a termite exterminator. And my initial idea was that it'll be really nice to do a film where there are these characters who love their animals, the bird, and a person who's morbidly fascinated with his animal, the termite. And you know, just the kind of contrast between a big bird that's this small and a tiny termite that is. So that's what I was initially headily thinking. So we had actually about 600 hours of footage. The main point being, it's in the edit that you keep kind of, it's as much about what you leave out as it is about what you keep in. So it is like a lot like sculpture, really. Um, and you basically, I cut the film in Copenhagen. Yeah, so I was there for about four or five months. And first we had an editor in India, and then he and I went to this wonderful editor called Charlotte, who actually has cut films like Act of Killing, etc. And um, with her, the thing I learned is, I, and now I'm diverging a bit, but uh, this is a good thing that I want to say to the question of iterations, that she had a totally different relationship to the question of drafts or iterations. So I tend to be a very top heavy cerebral person. So for me, it's often what does this shot after this shot mean? Whereas for Charlotte, it was often um, a kind of a dance. You know, she also has a background in dancing. So there's a kind of flow. So very often she would be like, uh, it doesn't matter what it means, but what does it, what does the stomach feel? You know, it's a kind of a stomach edit. It's a kind of a gut edit. And at first I was infuriated because I would like come with these big theses of what this shot after this shot means. and. She would literally say blah, 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 words. You know, it's like she'd actually shut me up. And I realized there's great wisdom in that. Because there's a kind of a emotional flow that actually creates meaning, which you can't be front-brained about. You know, you can't say this shot or this shot means this. You don't know what the shot of a snail uh, in front of those pyres can, in, a, in the flow of the film, create, right? And therefore, drafting in a doc is basically seeing endless rough cuts and then chiseling and you know playing with it and the collage that comes remind me of the question you get consumed by the fears and apprehensions but i mean there is no uh, you know it's like i none of me and uh, I mean all the other people who worked with me in the film were also the same set of people who worked in the last film with me. And none of us have ever actually, you know, done the thing of being AD's assistants in Bollywood. And all of us are scared of the big behemoth that is the Bombay film industry. So um, anyway, this is what one has, you know, like, of course, it's extremely demanding in every way, emotionally, physically, financially, in every single way. But you've chosen this, no? Ultimately, I've not chosen to do an MBA and get into a... There's something that you've... This is a sovereign choice, right? So it's both... 
it is undoubtedly unnerving because you know you feel like the floor on which you are standing is actually really thin ice and one failed film you feel like will be like you know you'll just completely because you've taken a risk and you're in free fall but at the same time you also then remind yourself well nobody's given us anything any one speaking a doc it's not like you feel like we couldn't have imagined in our wildest dreams that it would have taken the awards or nominations that it had back then obviously so it's both terrifying but also very um, you know beyond the point you go on doing what you're doing and it's not like you've clearly gotten into this line not because you want to make big amounts of money because but you're interested in what you're doing so the main thing is like i was belaboring in the speech right now was uh, to focus on process process is the reward what is the next one i th i think oh, uh, there delhi. is one uh, right so uh, if i was not in delhi the thing is that we are all very uh, me and the whole crew is very um, embedded in the like we all grew up in delhi etc so you are of course very familiar in the vernacular and colloquial cultures of the city um i don't know if i could have made this film in another city because there in truth there is a kind of a ready familiarity with even my last film which was about sleeping um called cities of sleep was also in delhi that was a significantly smaller film with almost no resources this is we like had we more resources in this but you know you know the city well you pick pick up subcultures better etc but having said that i life would be very limited and um restricted if i was just you know tethered to a city so i'd like to imagine that i can do the thing that i'm trying to write uh, right now is based in the sundarbans so and that i have no familiarity with so uh, i think my being from delhi helped but beyond the point i don't want to over determine its importance what was the next one what are the brothers right so uh, the of course the last year was uh, as uh, big and voluptuous for them as it was for me and the crew well firstly the good thing is that the producers of the film decided to fund the bird hospital for the next few years which is great because there is a you know like uh, documentaries are not philanthropic enterprises so uh, it's I, it's good if there are material fallouts other than that of course there's more media attention and spotlight on their work and the singular you know work that they've done in the recent years which is great so hopefully there's a kind of um, uh, effect on the donations they get as well and in a more uh, generalized way i think there is some value to being witnessed you know and they do really unique brilliant work so i think i'm glad that we were able to um get a glimpse of that but this is a very complex question because it's not easy when you um you know their lives uh, being air dropped into the red carpet of can or the oscars uh, all of which places they went is not easy at all and by the end nadeem by now has gone to more film festivals than i have so i mean he has more miles than i have and uh, the which is great but at the same time it begs a difficult question which is that it's not possible for one film to in one fell swoop change the life of a whole family one hopes that it provides them some kind of an oasis and alleviate some material conditions but it is a thorny question because essentially their image is creating value right and it's a value that the broadcaster is like say hbo is gaining from some producers are gaining and it's like a chain right so ethically in terms of the ethical compunctions of this one constantly tries to maintain as much hygiene as one can in terms of their presence everywhere outside in all the big events ensuring that the bird hospital gets funded and all of that but beyond that it's not easy this is a very very difficult question you know because now the limelight is shifting the award season is done with all of us will move on to different projects so it's not easy but uh, the main thing one can do is keep talking about this and there are also mature grown ups so uh, but all of which is to say it's not it's not a um, resolved question of course uh, thank you i think uh, 
Oh, you had a question, but... Oh, sorry, did I forget? What's the question? Uh, the question is about... I felt... Oh, right, yes, yes. Uh, that's an excellent question. The whole film's foundational idea is a kind of a uh, relationship between the background and the foreground, where so much of non-human life gets consigned to a kind of wallpaper of our lives, right? It's a kind of invisible... Like, birds are often a kind of a... Um, invisible murmur at the fringes of our vision, right? It's a kind of given or the predicate of our lives that is um, not, uh, you know, in a way the film had to kind of expand the kind of arts of noticing in that the background and the foreground keep waxing and waning. That sounds like a big way of just saying that essentially the idea was to also, uh, you know, direct focus or gaze. And I think any project that looks at the more than human has to essentially do that. So the all the shots of the animals have to do with either slow pans or slow tilts or focus shifts. These are the only three ways in which you can optically show simultaneity and coexistence, right? So um, this was the broader idea that we were trying to... So the background is a very important part, or backgroundness is a very important part of at least my thinking in the film. Thank you so much for so patiently responding to all the questions. I'm very glad that there were so many questions. Um, I would like to now invite our registrar, uh, Professor uh, Sridhar Patnaik, to give the concluding remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joyini. First of all, my sincere apologies. I walked in late into the program. Um, I just uh, uh, echo what the Vice Chancellor mentioned. This is our umpteenth commencement lecture, and we were taking rounds in addition to other activities going on. Uh, but I must confess, uh, therein lies uh, our advantage, and my advantage in particular, because I do come towards the end, but I do get an opportunity to sort of uh, listen through and to focus on uh, diverse uh, topics and themes uh, uh, having uh, had the opportunity to be part of other commencement uh, lectures, say one or two exceptions, uh, therein even lies the philosophy of this university wherein we deeply value and promote uh, uh, interdisciplinarity. And uh, the lecture this afternoon greatly testifies to that particular fact uh, because uh, Shonak, uh, apart from rendering his lived experiences, he spoke about uh, the film uh, based on the enthusiastic set of questions uh, we received uh, from students and faculty members alike. And I must share with our uh, distinguished guests and all other participants, we do have a journalism and communication school where Kajori is teaching and a film and new media studies program. So this aptly sits well even with that particular program or even uh, for that matter of fact, even with the environment and sustainability program. Again, going back to uh, talking about the advantages, which I just broached about a brief uh, while ago, you all students, being at the uh, Liberal Arts and Humanities School, you have a distinct advantage because when we try to uh, bring in the component and the value of liberal arts into every other sphere of activity, educationally and otherwise, you are at the core of these activities and being at the core of these activities, they give you a determined way to even achieve the much needed graduate attributes that we often talk about at this university, uh, which includes amongst other attributes, uh, even a certain value and understanding of uh, pluralism and uh, uh, critical reflection of the self and others, and even respect for heterogeneity and diversity and critical thinking uh, amongst other attributes. So uh, I appeal to each one of you, uh, to sort of, you know, uh, take up these uh, virtues as good practices and contribute to responsible university citizenry so that there is a greater harmony uh, over here at the uh, School of uh, Liberal Arts and Humanities and even at the OP Jinder Global University, wherein we expect you to even uh, abide by the regulations of the university and the advisories and the guidance that you re receive uh, from time to time from the school, from various other uh, relevant offices and even from the university 
without missing sight of the joy because the joy lies in uh, the kind of uh, pedagogical approach that we follow uh, in our teaching courses and all, uh, given the eclectic uh, uh, faculty members that we have, uh, both at the School of Liberal Arts and Universities and other schools of the university, and you will have an opportunity even to do courses from all the other schools, which your senior students might attest to the fact. And uh, another important uh, piece of advice to all the uh, newly admitted students, uh, while we welcome you, it's also very important. We understand and borrowing from Dr. Sain's uh, title of the lecture on beginnings. On beginnings, you also have some anxieties, right? About the place where you are, the people around you, be it your friends, your peers, your teachers, and other members of the community. Uh, but I just wanted to tell you that you will have support, academic and otherwise, from everyone at this university. And please be assured of that particular support. And whenever you have any concerns, please feel free to approach your school office or the faculty members. And even to my own office, you can write to or you can approach. And we will be there to help you in any which way. Because we do understand that transition takes some time. But nonetheless, very soon you will feel at home. So on this particular note, I congratulate uh, the dean and uh, the set of faculty members of the School of Liberal Arts and Humanities and all the administrative staff members for having curated this wonderful lecture this afternoon. And even my best wishes to each one of you uh, as you uh, start your new academic year. I also take this opportunity to personally and even on behalf of the university thank Dr. Sain for the wonderful lecture and for the insights that you had shared with all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Patnaik. I think uh, for me personally, one of the defining memories that remain from the screening of the movie and the talk is this image that you spoke about of this tree that was falling and the nectar just, you know. Falling. Poland, the Poland, uh, uh, and for me, you know, I think uh, those of you who are new to JGU and JSLH, you'll very soon realize that uh, the university always moves at a very frenetic pace. And I think that particular moment for me meant so much because it's so important to stop and think and reflect on what we are doing. So as you get caught up in classes and activities and things, uh, please also find moments to pause and think and reflect. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, thank you again. A big thank you to Dr. Sen uh, for <laughs> sharing this, his film and his time with us. Um, Thank you. The event has come to an end now. Um, I think some of you may have classes after after four, so um, please remember that.